Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, back with us again. Congratulations, a married man, Coach Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. Good to have you here, Chad. Good to be here. You look uh, you look exceptionally happy right now. It's good to have you. <laughs> Pretty happy, yeah. Yeah, and then we also, I don't think we've ever had this combo. Just one other person here joining us. We have Santa Cruz Hit Squad's Keegan Swenson. What's up, Keegan? Hey, guys. You're back up in the mountains. No more Tucson. I know I'm back. I'm excited. feels good to be back in the, the thin air. Yeah, I, actually, I, we're just going to get straight into like training advice and questioning right now. Are you taking a few days like to get back into training because of the altitude? Or did you take a few days just because you've recently done unbound? So you're really not like, you know, hammering it with training. How did you respond uh, to the altitude change considering you've grown up at it your whole life? Yeah. Um, last week was pretty easy. We were moving kind of back, moving back from Tucson and took a few days, chill, just hanging out, ride the e-bike and hang out a bit. And then this week's just kind of mellow volume to kind of ease back into training and the altitude at the same time. Um, normally the altitude doesn't bother me too much coming back up from Tucson. Um, but it is nice to still kind of ease back into it a little bit. You don't want to go straight into intervals at least because give myself a week or so to adjust. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Are you still going to keep your FTP the same that it was in Tucson? out of stubbornness yes, it is the same because <laughs> altitude mine. isn't real <laughs> just ride into it <laughs> i like it so you'll just get faster yeah good, good yeah. approach yeah it's close enough yeah yeah there we go it's like an ftp test you just force yourself in the altitude and keep doing it and just you know keep exactly. the ftp there yeah i see um all right well good to have you here uh, if you are listening to this right now, give it a thumbs up on YouTube and rate it on whatever podcast app, especially Spotify. I will be checking by the end of this podcast to see if we are number one on Spotify yet in cycling podcasts. Hopefully we are. We're getting close, but check that out. Also race analysis. Just yesterday, we posted a new race analysis video where Ivy broke down a recent crit that I did. It was the first time I had raced in like a year. I made tons of mistakes. So go learn from my mistakes. Go to trainer or youtube.com slash trainer road. Check it out. Subscribe, all that stuff. Keegan, since you're here, uh, Anne has a question, and I think that you're appropriate, the appropriate one to answer this. What is the spirit of gravel? Sincerely from a roadie. <laughs> That's a pretty good question. I think it's uh, kind of open to interpretation. Mm. Uh, I don't know if the spirit of gravel is, is still alive in uh, gravel racing. I think it's still out there. If you're out there just having a good time riding your gravel bike, and maybe it is in some of the races, but mm. I think they're I mean, racing is racing and I don't, I don't know. I think it's, but I think the spirit of gravel is just out on gravel bikes, having a good time, whether that's in the desert or mountains or wherever you are, just out riding. I think, uh, I kind of found out this winter doing some bike touring, hotel touring trips, just riding gravel bikes, gravel roads for seven hours a day with your friends. And I think that is the true spirit of gravel. I don't know, but it's just a pet. Friends that's as good of answer as I can give you. <laughs> Friends of the podcast, uh, Ryan Standish and Payson McKelvin recently said that the spirit of gravel, the things that the thing that people are chasing is actually just the feeling that mountain bikers have when they ride mountain bikes. I'd say that's accurate. Yeah. 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 It's just good times. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah, I've exactly. always seen it as a, it's, it's just a less, less extreme form of mountain biking and a more interesting form of road riding. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Cause you can have just as much fun. I, I think you can ride some really cool gravel roads and see some really cool stuff. It's just different than mountain biking. And if you're riding fast enough, it gets technical too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's certainly become a uh, spirit of gravel has become an excuse for uh, wanting everybody else to follow the way that you want to race and, and many other different things, but Hey, it's just good times on bikes, right? That's so, it. Yeah. The end, I, that I is it. It. Chad, this uh, next question from Alvaro. I love it says, Hey guys, first of all, thank you for everything that you guys do train and road and the podcast have changed my life and my cycling this year. I've been working hard to get ready for unbound and my training is going great while seeking how to upgrade my recovery. I found cryotherapy according to the cryo place, which they're talking about the facility that provides cryotherapy services, lowering my body temperature by standing in a freezing room for three minutes helps my recovery. What is the science on this? Does this help? Or is it just a placebo effect? Thanks from Alvaro. I'm, I like having my mind, uh, scene from Austin powers when he's frozen chat. <laughs> can, it's pretty close. You, okay, cool. So it's the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Understood. Um, uh, let's can you explain first, what is cryotherapy? And then I think we're going to get into some research on this, right? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I've got a, a, another mid dive, not super cool. deep. 
So what is it? Uh, first off, it, it's just a cold therapy and any cold therapies in general are aimed at particular things, uh, not least of which is reducing inflammation, especially chronic inflammation, pain in general, uh, can affect muscle spasms, reduce swelling, and it's used for both acute injuries as well as overuse injuries. So it covers quite a lot of bases. Um, whole body cryotherapy specifically is, is brief full body hence the whole body exposure to very cold, dry air and dry is crucial when we're talking about temperatures such as these anywhere between 110 and 140, or sorry, negative 110, 140 Celsius, which it's no real need to translate this to Fahrenheit, but I'll do it one time. It's that's 166 to 220. I don't know if that's relevant information for anybody because I think anywhere you can, you could, you're going to go, they're going to measure it in Celsius. So we're talking cold, extremely cold. And all of it's aimed at eliciting very strong physiological responses. Mm -hmm. And some, some finer points, there is a difference. You may see a reference to uh, cabin cooling versus whole body. In cabins, they're also called cryosaunas, basically leave the head exposed. And, and this results in, in an activation of different molecular pathways and hence possibly different outcomes. So there is a distinction. And the, the, the the difference between the two is that the cabins directly insufflate, we learned a new word, liquid nitrogen vapors into the box and hence it actually contacts the skin, right? Versus oh. the cryo chambers, on the other hand, which the liquid nitrogen fluxes through pipes in the walls, meaning that there's no free nitrogen in the chamber. And this Doesn't just immediately strikes me as a safer way. It, it must not, but I think the potential is definitely greater when it's touching you. Yeah. Cause I'm thinking of like, uh, I've seen trucks backing up with like liquid nitrogen and it's got warning signs all over everything. And the employees that have to operate it are in like suits. And that seems crazy. Yeah. Which will probably explain why the, the dosages are so, so brief. We'll get to that. It. And then, well, on the topic of finer points, there's, so we're going to use the term whole body cryotherapy, but we're actually talking about whole body cryo stimulation. So cryotherapy is actually used for treatment of painful symptoms of inflammation, traumatic conditions, that sort of thing. Whereas when you steer this type of cold therapy at recovery or performance enhancement, we're really talking about cryostimulation. Not really going to use that term, except I may slap the two together annoyingly over the course of it, because I, I hate referring to it as one thing when it's actually another, but all the studies call it whole body cryotherapy. Got it. Really cryostimulation, at least in our context, it is. So um, as far as how to apply it, let's, let's just cover that really quickly too. Um, the consensus amongst the research is strongly at negative 130 degrees Celsius. That seems to be what they use most commonly and for no more than three minutes. And more specifically, uh, a lot of the studies had subjects spend 30 seconds in a vestibule at negative 60 degrees. So kind of a priming cooling. And then they entered the cryo chamber you know, anywhere from 110 to 140 negative Celsius for again, no more than three minutes. And that was a hard upper limit. I didn't see anyone exceed three minutes for, you know, for obvious reasons. Wow. So is, is that like, this has to, Ke Keegan, have you heard about this as a pro athlete? I don't know. Like if you're constantly on the hunt for recovery stuff, I know you use recovery boots and foam roll and yeah, socks I mean, I, stuff. I've heard about it, but I don't really want to mess with that stuff. <laughs> Just doesn't <laughs> seem like it's worth the like anything that doesn't have like hundred percent science and mm -hmm. proof that it actually works just seems like it's kind of a waste of your effort that you could be doing something else that would further benefit your training and or recovery. Yeah. Well, we'll get into the science Chad. What are mm -hmm. like, what are the, we'll so in this case, Alvaro is saying that this helps recovery and Keegan, you just mm -hmm. hinted at that too. Like that that's kind of like the brand that precedes it, but what are its purported benefits, Chad? There, there are a number of them. And then there's a couple that are particularly relevant to endurance sports. So I'll we'll cover those after the, the generalities. First off, um, I'm, all of this is going to come from a 2017 literature review where they looked at by Lombardi, by the way, where they looked at whole body cryotherapy and its effects, uh, ranging from 2010 up to 2017. And I'll cut to the chase and use their words. The majority of evidence supports the effectiveness of whole body cryotherapy in relieving the symptomatology of a whole set of inflammatory conditions that could affect an athlete. So pretty, pretty wide, wide spectrum there. So it is a strong vote in favor of this paper, this review. However, the practicality as always rules the day, right? So there's, there's the issue of access to these, the expense of them, the accommodation of the additional stress, because as Keegan just mentioned, I mean, there are other ways you can spend your time. This is one of them. So it's at least going to be a time suck in a small way. Additionally, 
it, it's cold, it's exposure to cold. So this is another form of stress. This is another form of stress that you're heaping onto the pile of all the other stressors that, that you find yourself com coming under. And while on the topic of practicality, there's a hard recommendation across these papers of a minimum exposure set at 20 sessions. And this makes sense to me because consistency, right? I mean, you don't get fit from a single workout, which to me suggests that it might not be the 20, so much the, the 20 sessions of the whole body cryotherapy, but so much the 20 workouts that preceded each of these sessions. And I'm not labeling this as misattribution, but you know, is it the cryotherapy that's actually yielding these benefits or is it the consistent exercise that's followed by the cryotherapy that's yielding these benefits? So who, who can say, and none of these papers delved into that matter. Um, as far as the, the most common uses for this, yeah, injury recovery, and that applies to both traumatic injuries and overuse injuries, and then post-workout and post-season recovery. And more recently, and this is where it got really interesting, is there may be a competition prep benefit. And I'll cover that last. That's wild. Um, so pre, uh, wait, wait, like, is, does that mean pre-race you would want to mm -hmm. do this? Mm -hmm. Like like very pre close pre-race? Yeah, we'll pre talk about that. It's, it's interesting. Oh. It's intriguing for sure. Hmm. And then, uh, so more, more specifically, let's start with, uh, the effects on exercise induced muscle damage. And then of course it's partner in life delayed onset muscle soreness. So EIMD <laughs> and DOMS and, and I'll harken back to 2011 poor not used a 45 minute exercise inducing muscle exercise induced muscle damaging trail run. And they accompanied it with four whole body cryotherapy sessions administered one time per day. And what they noted one was that there was an increase in neutrophil count of 114%, which is you know, pretty vast. And neutrophils are basically nascent red blood cells. So baby red blood cells. And this peaked at about an hour post, which led the authors to conclude, or th they thought it suggested stimulated angiogenesis. So more blood vessels, which meet, leads to improved muscle perfusion, which leads to greater delivery of muscle to the blood, which is that which then led to the delayed or a reduction in the delayed onset muscle soreness and then improved recovery. So it took a little while to get there, but the short version is that it stimulated responses that led to faster recovery, which means quicker return to training and or competition. And then Banfi uh, in a later study also noted reductions in circulating creatine kinase. And they looked at rug rugby players, but still, you know, markers of muscle damage and they saw reductions in it via whole body cryotherapy applied on alternate days over a one week period. So, so that's like a three to four days a week, basically that they are three days a week that they did this. Yep. Yep. Looks at three, maybe four. Got and it. then numerous studies look at the, I'm just going to start calling it WBC whole body cryotherapy. <laughs> WBC stimulates the anti-inflammatory response and Dugu demonstrated these anti-inflammatory effects via WBC as obtained without the occurrence of exercise induced muscle damage. So point being is that the reductions came in, uh, reductions in inflammation occurred without the need for all that pesky exercise. So along these lines, when we're looking at, this is when looking at non-athletes, they also noted that fitness capacity impacts the inflammatory response to WBC, suggesting the possibility that this anti-inflammatory response may carry to even increase in athletes as well. So athletes are more, uh, positively affected by this. Is that what perhaps, that, that, uh, perhaps, that's, yep. yep. To yep, recap, that's, that's the suggestion here to recap what I heard there. It's that, uh, they were tracking after cryotherapy, they were tracking in some athletes in one study, and they found that there were more red blood cells produced, uh, as a result mm -hmm. that could bring more good things to your muscles, their AKA better for recovery. Mm -hmm. And then in the other group that creatine kinase, a marker that uh, kind of parallels you know, with all the damage that you do to your muscles, that that was reduced as a result of doing cryotherapy. Correct. And correct. Okay. Got it. Um, so what about uh, the other way that I've seen this, uh, another benefit I've seen for this, I don't know if there are any studies on this is looking at the fat metabolism benefits. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is where it always like anything that claims to burn body fat. It's always like, <laughs> it's always tricky to me. And this one I've seen like people like you literally freeze the fat away. And that yeah, sounds yeah, like right. very markety, not sciencey. And, and that is, but it, it, I mean, it's known that cold activates activity in our fat tissue, right? Both the brown adipose tissue that we've actually talked about pretty extensively in a previous podcast and even white adipose tissue. So the, you know, the subcutaneous that we carry around problem is, um, one study, at least by Le Lubkowska 
and, and colleagues used six months of aerobic, aerobic activity and they paired it with whole body cryotherapy and it didn't have any impact on body mass, body fat, or lean mass percentages. But that said, the researchers only used 20 sessions. And, and this raises a question, is 20 sessions enough? And <laughs> this is an impossible name, but it's Sizigula, it's S-Z-Y-G-U-L-A. In 2014, basically asked, is 20 enough? They, they noted that at 10 sessions, there was a decrease in hemoglobin, which is a big concern to endurance athletes. This decrease remained after 20 sessions, and then it rose back to normal after 30 sessions. And in a similar manner, there was a decrease in hematocrit and a decrease in red blood cell volume to go hand in hand after five sessions, 10 sessions, and 20 ses sessions. Sorry. And the author said that this is likely due to hemolysis, basically the breakdown of the blood following these low count exposures. The point being that whole body cryotherapy is hard on the blood, specifically the red blood cells. This, however, can lead to an increase in EPO. So, you know, we, 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 uh, offend the, the, the red blood cells or insult them. And then the response is to produce more red blood cells. And before you go there, I know some people are thinking along these lines, this effect on EPO was minimal and in no way performance enhancing. It just restored the balance. And then back to fat metabolism. I think this begs the question, would 30 plus sessions have favorably impacted any of those unchanged body composition variables? I mean, having capped it at 20, who knows what would have happened over those next 10 sessions. And then really quickly, I'll just touch on uh, the hormonal or the endocrine effects, the, that side of things. Whole body cryotherapy was shown to decrease, did demonstrate a decrease in psychophysical stress hormones, cortisol being head of, head of the list, as well as an increase in anabolic hormones like testosterone, which obviously impacts favorably in this case, testosterone cortisol ratios. However, do not pin your hopes to either of these effects because as scientists often state, when there is not a lot of literature on a particular topic or subtopic, these both merit further investigation. So I guess recapping that section too, it seems like this could actually be in the short term detrimental to training potentially mm -hmm. when you talk about the damage that it could do to the blood. And if you're carrying on, like going through a training block that could affect your ability to, to hit your marks in your training. Seems and like. I think that's the big hitch because if it, if it, for whatever reason, everything seems to pan out at about 30 sessions. Well, that means you're going to have to schedule this very strategically. And I mean, I, I don't know what it costs. I didn't look into the cost of it. I don't know what the availability of these, these centers are. I, I don't know how much work actually goes into doing this, but I do know that doing anything 30 times in as many days or as many workouts is going to add complexity to your training regimen. Yeah. It's like eight to 10 weeks. If you're doing it that three to four times a week. Right. And that's mm -hmm. eight to 10 weeks of doing something alongside your training and then risking potential negative impacts while you're going through that training that would, I mean, who knows? I, I don't know what sort of actual impact that would have on your ability to train, but it's certainly worth noting. Um, sure. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, especially I, if it's, you know, 30, 40 minute hour long car drive each way yeah, to and from, completely. like, I, I know there's not one where I live. Yeah. At least as far as yeah. I know, maybe so, one I mean, down in the salt Lake Valley. And so yeah, which is you'd have to drive every drive. single time. And mm -hmm. it just seems yeah. like there's probably a better use of your time or another way you can get the same amount of recovery, whether that's sauna or, you know, ice bath, if you like those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 No, that's Do you what, use I'll, ice baths, I'll, I'll, Keegan? I'll touch on that. No, I, oh, cool. I don't like those either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nothing I don't like. Like. <laughs> Sound off. Yeah. I just don't yeah. think, I don't know. I feel like they don't, I thought there's not enough proof that they actually help with recovery. And I've heard mixed things about how they can actually like blunt like adaptations and like actual recovery in the mm -hmm. short term, if that makes sense. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's true or not, but I, it does. It I seems like I just don't like them. And it seems like it's an extra pain in the ass to do it. Yeah. Most, most of the reading I've done on the topic says to save them basically for periods of, you know, within a stage race, for instance, or, or yeah. high training where, where you're on a taper and you're not looking to further any adaptation so much as support recovery. Was there any of that with the cryotherapy? Like, does it blunt training adaptations as well? Uh, it, or do they don't know? No. Well, actually, let me, let me get to some of the upsides because there are a couple upsides, clear upsides for endurance athletes. And, and first of which is the, the redox balance. So, you know, the, the, the balance between oxidants and antioxidants, or as we more commonly refer to it, oxidative stress. And that they, a number of studies noted that any number of these whole body cryotherapy sessions did lead to generally beneficial antioxidant effects. So even just a one-timer did reduce oxidative stress. They also noted that there was a clear dose dependency 
And Lipkowska again, no, put pinned this at 20 being optimal for the number topping out antioxidant effects. So any more than that didn't really further those effects, but 20 seemed to be the, the high point. And then when it comes to bone health, and, and we all recognize that high level physical activity is often associated with both osteopenia and should it go further osteoporosis, Banfi in 2010, Galliera in 2012 showed both in their own ways, measurable positive effects on bone growth. The takeaway being that, that the potential exists for both post-fracture recovery and stress fracture prevention. Hmm. And as they put it, whole body cryotherapy could counteract inflammation induced bone resorption. So an upside on both the bone side of things and on the antioxidant side of things. But that was still a minimum of 20 times. With the, with the antioxidants, with the, or with, yeah, yeah. With the, the oxidative stress into things, but again, benefits with each session just seem to top out around 20. Interesting. Interesting. And this is, uh, I wonder what the mechanism is there that's helping with bone re bone growth density, all that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, they, they had numerous theories and again, yeah. this being a, a, a mid level dive, not really. Yeah, totally. It's interesting. Long. I feel like this like might not be the same, but it sounds a lot, a lot of these sounds similar to what you can get out of a sauna as well, even though it's the complete opposite thing. Totally. Yeah, like maybe it, I'm it, kind of, maybe I'm a little bit off on a few things, but it seems like the majority of it, you can get out of like 15 minutes in a sauna as well. And, and that, is that is probably the take more point. accessible, you know? Yeah. You know, and then that's, that's a, a super solid point. And it's not really one that I was driving toward, but the fact is there are a lot of options that may be time better spent. Right. Chad, what about some contraindications that we, we have with all this? Yeah, there, there are, oh man, there's a host of them, but that's, it's just, there's a host with any, I mean, watch any drug commercial and they list off all the, the possibilities <laughs> there, there, there are always these Quick. possibilities. Minuscule, they may be. Hyperspeed. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, I'm just going to, just going to touch on some of the ones that are more relevant. Uh, vascular diseases seems pretty obvious. Uh, sympathetic neuro, uh, nervous system neuropathies. So, you know, any, any issues on the sympathetic autonomic side of things, acute respiratory disorders claustrophobia is a concern. I mean, you're in a, you're in a small chamber, whether it's a cabin or a, or a, uh, so, uh, not a sauna. What's the other one? Chamber. The whole chamber. The, yep, that's yeah. the word. Uh, Raynaud's disease, Jonathan, oh, and, and really any local blood flow disorders. I mean, consider if you're already challenged with the blood flow and if you're already suffering from something like Raynaud's, I don't know if this is a great way to go. All of these things, all, all of the counter contraindications, that I looked at just underline the point that this, this is not a DIY sort of recovery enhancement, performance enhancement tool. <laughs> Don't try to manufacture one of these and make it work. <laughs> have you, Terrible have you all idea. ever used dust off or like that compressed air in a can stuff that sure. you get? Yeah. I'm just like thinking of somebody having like 20 people turn those things upside down and spray them. And if you turn them upside down and spray them, I don't know. It's, I don't know if it is liquid nitrogen, but it will absolutely burn your skin. Sure. Well, that, which brings <laughs> me to my next point. I, this has to involve skilled, well-trained professionals because yeah. even simple oversights, like you just mentioned, like think of any wetness on the skin. What if you go in with slightly sweaty armpits? I mean, this will oh. lead to severe burns. So it has to be done exactly right. Hmm. And then I guess actually that let makes me... sense with that prep chamber, uh, just to make sure that people aren't, you know, like they're cooled off enough so that they're not sweaty, especially if that, they're afraid or anything else coming into that it. That might be the reasoning it. behind it. Yeah, that may be, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I didn't uh, dig further into why the why of those 30 seconds. Um, uh -huh. I do want to mention just a couple of interesting notes before we get to the closing points here. First, the maximum decrease in core temperatures seems to take place at about 50 to 60 minutes post which to me just Whoa. says it's a long time being cold. So you're exposed to the cold and, and that's going to be uncomfortable. You can bet. But then for nearly an hour afterwards, your temperature drops, 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 and you reach its lowest quite a while after, which means then you got to warm back up. So again, this doesn't sound like a, a quick fix. It's not something like slapping on your, uh, one of those compression boots called and, and just sitting there comfortably for a little while, rather you're going to be very uncomfortable initially, and then pretty uncomfortable for quite a long time afterward. That's crazy. I, I wouldn't have anticipated that, that it takes that long for your body temperature to Same. reach its low point. Whoa. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I, it was also interesting, uh, Hammond looked at or noted in, in another, yet another study and all these additional studies that I've mentioned are linked in, uh, that, that, uh, Lombardi paper. There's actually only two papers, Lamardi covering all of these studies, but that, that females exhibit better cooling efficiency than males. The nutshell being that 
that females get colder or lose heat faster. And this actually lends itself to this particular process. And then one potential impact on the effectiveness, the other direction is BMI. So if your body composition is high, meaning that you're a bit more insulated for lack of a better term, you actually lower the potential for the God, uh, whole body cryotherapeutic benefit due to the reduction in cooling efficiency. So it's just the flip side of that. Wow. Uh, Chad, I, and actually in the live chat right now, we had somebody say, no DIY empties dry ice from bathtub. <laughs> um, yeah. well, still do the there, bathtub. Yeah. Well, we'll what talk alternatives about, are there? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so cold water immersion is probably the the leader right there. And it's the simplest, it's the most accessible. Um, the it whole body cryotherapy actually lowers skin temperatures further than cold water immersion, but both of these cold therapy interventions lead to similar reductions in muscle and core temperatures, which is really what you're after. So the point being is ice baths are arguably as effective, much more accessible, but if I recall correctly, require longer durations. I don't think you hop into a, an ice bath for just three minutes. Uh, I'm not sure I haven't dug into that, but it's, maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's 10. I don't know. Maybe it's 30. I, I don't know. And then uh, ice packs, you know, they do a decent job but their clear limitation is just cooling localization. It's only going to be, you know, where the ice is in contact with skin. The ice bath thing is interesting because I guess if you're doing uh, one example of where I would want to use ice baths is if I was doing multiple races in the day, mm -hmm. if it's cyclocross mm -hmm. season and I've got, I don't know, for some reason I'm racing in the morning and then again in the afternoon or something like that, if it's hot, I would want to jump into that thing to get my core temp down as soon as I can from that race. hundred percent. I'm sure that we've all felt that after like, a, especially a late evening race when you race. And then after that, you just, you can't sleep because it's your core temp is just jacked up from all that racing. And that's one where area where I'm thinking of the motocross uh, world, for example, they have a race and then within 45 minutes, they have to go out and do another half hour race and that they just generate so much body heat. And it's really beneficial for them to be able to get down that body temper, that core temp down so they can get into a parasympathetic state and relax a bit before they go back out and do more racing. But outside of that, yeah, it's tough. Um, cause it can, it can blunt recovery. Like you mentioned, Keegan, I remember that from us, from an episode that we've talked about on ice baths before Chad and about the potential for it to do that. It's kind of tricky. So DIY, in other words, there's no way to DIY at the level that we're talking about with whole body cryotherapy. Instead, if you're just looking to lower core temperature, there's more accessible ways to do it. Is that a fair, uh, a fair assessment of that, Chad? Completely. Yeah. If you're going to DIY this ice baths and cold packs seem to be the way to go. Cool. Uh, so let's, can we cover the one thing we didn't talk about is this competition prep thing, yeah. which seems even more logistically complex. Like hopefully you mm -hmm. have a like a parking lot crit outside of the, this place <laughs> doesn't, <laughs> doesn't it doesn't. And, and I'll explain why. So this, okay, this cool. is a 2019 paper by Partridge and colleagues, and they examined whole body cryotherapy's potential as competition prep. And their intent was to summarize and evaluate the acute effects of whole body cryotherapy or cryo stimulation. And again, cutting to the chase, they, they noted that integrating WBC with active warm up shows potential for improved performance. So they did admit that there was a potential there, their science, their study did back this up. And they noted many of the same findings that I mentioned in the Lombardi review, but why I included this particular study is they mentioned something that wasn't covered there. And that is applicable acutely is that they observed an increase in post-activation potentiation, which is basically a physiological phenomenon where a priming exercise leads to improved muscle output later on for as long as one to three hours post priming, which was totally news to me because I thought PAP was more of an immediate, much shorter lived benefit. Hmm. And this says otherwise, which in and of itself is interesting, but again, it's just not widely practical in competition or is it? I mean, if that window lasts for one to three hours and you can have a session three hours prior, two hours prior, one hour prior, one hour prior, it, you know, maybe it's worthwhile. So for anyone can swing, who can swing it, I do think that the use of whole body cryotherapy prior to competitions, prior to workouts can in fact lead to what they noted, an alleviation of pain and sense of fatigue, because basically what is fatigue, but the brain's response to muscle damage, low fuel availability, high stress hormones, elevated sympathetic activity, insufficient recovery, et cetera. So if you think about it, pain and, and the reduction in fiber recruitment that so often accompanies it is effectively the arch enemy 
of workout quality maximization. It's pretty hard to have both things at once. So the answer to, to this question was that it could potentially benefit competition. And then the answer to the, the general question asked initially is that, uh, could whole body cryotherapy stimulation be leveraged to aid recovery, increase workout quality, improve performance. The research does point to yes. I, I wonder if uh, any sports teams have this in the locker room mm. or are going to have these in the locker room, you know, like the players emerge from the smoke. <laughs> from the, I, I don't the, doubt that. And then they go right out onto the field, you know, effectively. Yeah. So interesting. So Chad, to recap, uh, there's not a lot of science to, to back up. It seems like that it might be, that it's just like a, a full obvious net positive for recovery. seems like it could fly in the face of itself. If your goal is recovery, is that accurate based on the research we have? I, I think if you whittle it down to the fact that it requires so much repetition that you can't just do five sessions and, and derive an obvious benefit, then yeah. And then for pre-competition prep, uh, it does have some promising, uh, some promising science behind it. Early science, yeah, early research, early positive findings, but again, the logistical challenges. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, I instantly terrified of it cause I don't like cold. Uh, and mm, yeah, with yeah, Raynaud's that I would be completely Same. out even yeah. three minutes. I mean, it sounds like, Oh, it's just Ooh. three minutes. Well, yeah, it's three long minutes. You can bet. I've never spent, I mean, I've never experienced conditions that cold and I'm mm -hmm. just thinking about being in really cold lakes for three minutes. That's all at those three minutes stretch into an eternity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just had some exposure to that and just hanging out for 30 seconds was, is a long time. I mean, maybe it's different with water <laughs> versus cold air. I don't know, but I can't imagine it'd be that much different. Yeah. Crazy, huh? Keegan, any parting thoughts on this one before we move into Ella's question? This doesn't sound like it's for me. Yeah. <laughs> That's there we go. It. Nice. Uh, Ella says, I recently completed my first 18 mile cross country race. It was three laps long. And my strategy was to keep my heart rate in the top of zone four, not dip into zone five until the second and third lap. So she's saying stay in threshold, but not go above threshold until the second and third laps. Uh, so she's planning on doing the opposite of what most XC races do, right? Which is, uh, go easy and then pick it up toward the end. And in most cases, most amateurs, they completely go wide open and then they blow up and they just limp their way through the rest. So, uh, Ella, this seems like a very sound strategy to have in place, trying to counter the natural reaction that we all have in these races. Ella says on the second and third laps, I ended up averaging about the same heart rate as the first lap. I had planned to let my heart rate go into the high end of zone five in the last lap of the race, but I just could not get it up there. I felt like I was exerting more effort on the last lap, but in previous shorter races, doing this would have resulted in my heart rate maxing out. At this point, I was quite fatigued, still going very strong. So my question is this, if I start a race with a moderate effort and continue to increase the effort as I get closer to the finish, why did my heart rate increase or not increase accordingly? And then she also says, should I exert more effort at the beginning of the race or do I need a different strategy altogether? Thanks for all your help from Ella. Uh, Keegan, first of all, do you, I want to cover this cause this is, we're talking about a cross country race. Do you pay attention to heart rate and when you're racing? Uh, never, <laughs> I don't, I don't really, sometimes I'll look at power to pace a little bit, but cross country is normally just, uh, you're kind of just going with it and it's a lot of it's RPE and kind of racing with the group that you you're with, as long as it's not pushing it too far above, uh, heart rate tends to like lag a little bit on the effort. So if you do a really hard effort, the heart rate, your heart rate's not going to spike a little bit later. So it's really like, it's kind of hard to pace off of for cross country. I think it could work okay. And really long, if you're doing a marathon race, maybe it work a little bit better, but I think for cross country, it's not really quite applicable. I think, like you said, her strategy of pacing was actually quite good, but the heart rate is just the wrong way to do it. And I think just going off your like feel or RPE is definitely a better way. Um, yeah, there's Sorry. Yeah. Keep going. But so I don't even, I don't normally I don't even race with a heart rate monitor. I just don't, I don't love the feeling of it on my chest and just would rather not have it. Um, so I do wear it from time to time just to get some data, but normally I just use power and just race off of RPE. So nice. Chad, there's any number of reasons that I'm thinking of when, uh, Ella is talking about starting on easy ramping up, but then the heart rate, not reflecting that, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the increased RPE that she was uh, mentioning and, the increased effort, but there's so many things that could cause that, right. Where your heart rate just isn't reaching the levels that you anticipate it would. Yeah. I think commonly, 
<clears throat> is going to be fatigue. I mean, if you hit a ceiling and you know you you have greater heart rate capacity, but you can't push all the way up to it, there's got to be fatigue at work. I mean, uh, there are probably some other explanations, but the most obvious one would be that you're just carrying a little heaviness into it, a little central governance, right? You can't, you, some some aspect of your subconscious is not allowing you to to push that hard. There's some form of overhanging fatigue that is restricting you effectively, centrally. Yeah. And I, I, I've found that it can mess with me further and then compound because I'm like, so if you look at that heart rate, Ella, in this case, you might be like, well, I'm not pushing hard enough, but you might actually be pushing plenty hard. So then you end up trying to push harder and you push harder and then you blow up. And then you ask the question you're like, well, why did I blow up? If my heart rate wasn't even that high, that shouldn't have happened. It's a frustrating situation that I'm sure a lot of people can get into. And that's why, I mean, heart rate's just not really a good indication. Um, uh, of, of what you're actually doing in the race in terms of work. That's, this, that's the, the tricky part. So. This question is, is more of a, a strategy question than it is a heart rate question. I mean, ditch the heart rate and instead think about what, you, what, you're, what you're trying to accomplish strategically. Because what she's described here, what Ella's described, is effectively a database strategy where she has numbers and she's going to try to do whatever is necessary, regardless of how it feels, to adhere to those numbers, which is problematic as, as we're discussing right now. And then there's the whole competition dictated strategy, which was what Keegan just touched on, where you do whatever's necessary to hang in there, depending on what your goals are for the race or what's for, how you feel, because it, which actually leads to pretty much a combination of the two strategies where you want to do whatever's necessary, but within reason, you know, you have limits, you know, how you feel on the day, you know, where your fitness is relative to your competitors usually. So you have to, you know, temper your expectations, not you, you can't just relate it to the numbers that you want to hit, the numbers that you should see. You have to also say, you know, the, the numbers aren't there. This is what the competition is doing. I can do this for so long. I mean, th there's just so much comes into it where it, it does boil back down to skipping the metrics and racing by what you feel. Again, the, the metrics are just, and they're not even icing on the cake. They're just additional information. You, you, you can do what you can do. It doesn't matter what the numbers are telling you. And sometimes I feel like, you also don't really know what you can do hmm. like until you're racing. And I know mm -hmm. at Cape Epic every day, I felt like, I mean, we were starting every day, like it was a 90 minute cross country race. And you just, you're like, well, I can't do this for four hours, but I guess, guess we're going to do it for four hours. <laughs> so you kind of like, don't really know That's what you're capable of until you point. do it. So I think it's like, sometimes it's worth gambling to stay with that group that you think you can't stay with. And maybe this race you blow up, but maybe the next race you make it to three out of four laps. And then the last race you're in it the whole time. So I think everyone else is going to be hurting probably just as bad. And you just have to find like, sometimes you have to push yourself and um, like sure pacing has its place, especially if you're at high altitude or if it's a longer event, but for an 18 mile cross country race, if it's at mild altitude or sea level, I think you're capable of more than you think you might be. Hmm. Totally different than something like Leadville, right? Keegan is <laughs> like, right. polar opposite. like at Leadville, yeah. like, when you're at 10,000 feet, you have to be really smart with your efforts. And even then, I don't think heart rate is quite the right tool. Cause you might be excited at the beginning, your heart rate's going to be a little elevated, but you still don't want to push too hard with your legs. So up there, I think power is definitely the only, even RPE can be off. Cause mm -hmm. you, sometimes you feel good at altitude for a while, then you don't realize how hard you've been going. Like I got 300 Watts feels way easier than, than it should. So I think like uh, even up there, it's hard to pace without power. Um, RPE, you have to even knock it down a few levels than you think you should, I think. But yeah, yeah for cross country, you just, I'm just got to risk it for the biscuit, you know, just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm, when I'm thinking about that pacing aspect of it. And so let's talk, I'll talk about the Leadville side of things. My personal experience at Leadville, it felt dead easy until I got to power line, like the whole day did. I also made sure that I wasn't coasting. I was always like on the gas, except coming down Columbine, of course. Um, but I was on the gas, but I was never pedaling hard and it felt boring and it felt like it wasn't a race. It felt like I was just out for a cruise. Well, that same pace, by the time I got to power line felt, or uh, that, that just felt completely like it detonated me. Right. And, yeah. and that's, you'll notice in a lot of the training plans uh, that we have that your Saturdays and stuff will get a little bit longer. And we also give you the chance to be able to pick like workout alternates and you can do longer endurance work instead of something that might be a little bit shorter and more into like the tempo range. And you can do something that's a little bit lower. You'll notice that even with that endurance work, you're like, yeah, this is no problem. I can do, you know, 60%, 70% of FTP and I can do it. No problem. And then once you get to two hours of 70% FTP, you're like, whoa, 
that snuck up on me. Suddenly it's, it's getting more difficult. So this is like a good example of why RPE can really decouple. But when you're talking about a cross country Olympic race, it like RPE is very, very helpful to pace with. If you're fortunate enough to just be soloing away from a field, then yeah, you might want to look at power to kind of keep yourself in check and you can check that. Uh, if you're in a situation where everybody's way faster than you, you're just going to be doing an individual time trial. Once again, power can be good, but I really like Chad's quote that I've said countless times, uh, and it's not Chad's, I'm sure it's somebody else's, but in the sense that power should not replace perception, it should inform perception, right? So, and that goes with, with data all, all across the board. When I race XEO Keegan, I'm typically in a battle. If I'm, if I'm having a great day, I might be able to go with the first place person, or I might be leading but in most cases I'm right there toward the front in that battling pack. And it really is a situation where you just have to, you have to kind of place bets and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Ella thinking about your racing, if it's not an a priority race, I really like Keegan's approach of approaching things with curiosity and just being like, Hey, maybe I can make this, maybe I can't, but I'm going to give it a shot and see yeah, how it goes. Within, that's within reason too. You know, you can't be like sprinting yeah. and going full gas. You have to be like, okay, like I reasonably think like you're just mm -hmm. a little bit above what you think you can do. Not yeah. Like, Sophia, sh if Sophia yeah. shows up to the race, don't try to hold with Sophia. Uh, right. <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah, different yeah you gotta level. be smart about it, but you still can push yourself a little bit further than you think you might be able to. Yeah, for sure. Now, when it comes to your a race though, Ella, if you know, is also course dependent too, right? Keegan, if, mm -hmm. if a course, has like, everyone's going to start super hard. And then after that, it just gets super steep and super punchy after that initial hard start, those people could lose a huge amount of time. Whereas if you could ease your way into it, you might be able to really make up some time on them. So you want to mm -hmm. find basically, will a really hard effort, will you be punished for a really hard effort by the course profile? Meaning will once you're in a very fatigued state, will you get hit with efforts that are simply over threshold necessarily just to be able to get up and over steep obstacles, steep hills, anything else like that. And if that's the case, then this pacing strategy that you're laying out, Ella, of going a little bit easier within yourself and then working your way into it can pay huge dividends. It's a, it can be a really smart strategy. So field and course dependent for sure. Mm -hmm. Any other tips on this one? Cool. I think that's it. Uh, Holland's question, by the way, if you're joining us on the live chat right now, thumbs up, give it a thumbs up. Uh, more thumbs will help. Uh, that makes more people find the podcast. Uh, Holland says, first, I love you all. Train road in general is awesome. I've been a user for just over six months and gave, I got increases from 188 to 225 FTP. Way to go, Holland. I'm bumping right against four Watts per kilogram and I'm a CPA and I'm just a bit obsessed with the numbers. <laughs> I bet you have spreadsheets for your power to weight ratio, Holland. And I, I'm not judging. I do too. Um, Here's my question. I'm having a major surgery this week. I'm right in the middle of my build plan. The surgery will put a stop to my training for three to six weeks. So how do I tell the software this? The thought of it looking like I'm just skipping workouts makes me kind of sick. I'd like to pause the program if possible, but then when I return, I assume I'll be weaker. So then I might fa fail all of my workouts. You've got adaptive training for this. We'll talk about it. It'll help you. So hopefully this question makes sense. What's your suggestion when major interruptions happen to training? It's so sad and defeating to think my numbers will go down. So first of all, how it works in training road. And then we'll talk about some other stuff here about coming back to training and dealing with that, you know, uh, that fear of numbers going down. So annotations, when you use trainer road and you go into the calendar, when you click on a day, you can add an annotation. And when you do that, you can mark it as time off and you can give any different number of reasons. It has a selection of different reasons that you can add. You can add notes to that, do anything and say it goes from X date to Y date. And what this will do is plan builder will see that and say, oh, okay, I'm going to bump that training. So then that athlete doesn't miss the training. I'm going to consider that time off and we're going to readjust the plan. So then the athlete can still get the training they need. It doesn't mean that your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday workouts, whatever it is, will just be bumped to the next Monday, Wednesday, Friday. In some cases it will, in some cases, plan builder may change your plan because it may affect the periodization of everything a bit more. So this replaced something that we initially called push and pull weeks. Annotations is just a way better way to do it. And it works really well with adaptive training. You also don't have to worry about this because when you come back to training, you're going to do some workouts that are scheduled for you. And depending on how you do with those workouts and depending on the surveys that you fill out on how the workouts felt, adaptive training is going to make sure that the training gets calibrated for you. So in this case, no 
stress. You can plan the time off with annotations and adaptive training takes care of the rest. So that's all good news for you, Holland. Uh, when we, I want to take a little bit of time though, to talk about when you take time off and the sort of the loss of fitness, we've covered this on a previous episode, Chad. Um, and there's even a blog post that's called detraining what happens when you lose fitness. And you can check this out, Holland and anybody else listening to this, but like loosely, Chad, when you take, when you miss a week or t- a week of training, or when you miss months of training, what are the basic things that people can expect? <clears throat> you, just, you just go backwards. It's it, and it's the, it, it's simplistic, but it does actually stack up or does, does hold true The the amount of time it takes you to build a particular form of fitness is about the amount of time it takes you to lose it. So it takes quite a long, a long time to build deep aerobic fitness. It also takes quite a long time to lose all of it. Yes. There is like a, a period of time where if you miss so many days, you, you barely take a hit and then there's a precipitous decline after that. And that is what it is. It it just, this is three to six weeks. You're, you're lucky. You're not talking about three to six months in in frame the frame of major surgery. That's, that's not the longest window. You're only going to lose so much fitness, especially if you've been diligent with your training and you've built up a, a good foundation. I mean, your increase from roughly 190 to 225 is geez, what, like a 15% increase. That's substantial. That says to me, consistency, hard work, you're doing all the right things. You're in a place where, yep, you're going to lose some of that, but you're also coming from a place where you know how to build it back up. You've built it up from 188 to 225. Now you're going to come back at, I don't know, 200 and you're going to build it to 250 or whatever it may be. But it, it, it just is what it is. You have to resign yourself to the fact that you're going to lose some fitness. Um, I don't know if your situation is one where three weeks into your recovery, you can get back on the bike, but uh, I always try to push the possibility of maintenance. If you can just get on the bike for a single workout here and there, if for whatever reason you're allowed to do high intensity, push it toward the high intensity th- end of things and keep it, keep it light, but obviously, or I'm um, keep it short, but obviously your doctor is going to have to be the, the sounding board for any of those, uh, any, any, anything you do decide to do, should you have the, the option? Yeah. Within that uh, article that I mentioned there, there's some basic like timetables for the different types of fitness that could be lost and then different maintenance workouts that you could do or different things to maintain it. So, and typically what you see is that the higher intensity stuff tends to drop off pretty quick. Like when we talk about sprint power, it's crazy, right? Chad, how quickly we can lose like our efficiency at sprinting. <laughs> yeah, totally. But on the other side of it, it, it reaccumulates just as quickly. So yeah, yep. easy come, easy go, right. And it, uh, easy is not the right word because you, you work for sprint fitness, but if it, if it comes quickly, probably dissipates quickly. And the same could be said for the, or I guess the opposite could be said for the aerobic side of things, but the same principle applies, right. In the mm-hmm. sense that it takes time to build aerobic fitness, but it also takes more time for it to drop off. So you can count on the fact that, you know, you aren't going to just be restarting from zero after three to six weeks. Um, so check out that article. It gives maintenance workout suggestions and some different things you can do to help sprint power, muscular endurance, anaerobic capacity, aerobic endurance. And you can look at all that and see roughly about how much time you expect to, or wh- what you expect to drop off from and how to adjust it. Keegan, mm-hmm. how have you handled that? Um, I think that you you've dealt with illness, I'm sure as everybody else has over the past year or two. How do you come back to training? Is it like, cause I've seen you come back. It's not just that you do a ton of easy work for a long time, but you also don't seem to just like instantly hit it, you know, with something that's too intense right off the bat. Yeah, definitely. Uh, obviously it's kind of depends on the situation, but I think it's good to just kind of ease into it. You know, uh, there's no reason to rush, like going straight into VO2 and like super high intensity stuff. I think I like to kind of slowly ramp into it with like kind of mellow volume. And then after a couple of weeks, add like some harder, like M plus stuff. Um, but it just seems like sometimes jumping into it too early can almost set you back further. If you're trying to, if you're coming from an injury or recovery, like just want to make sure everything's running well. And, uh, for me, it's just like, you know, a week or two of like two hour rides and I had in three hour rides and then it goes to like some four hours and then it gets a little harder. Then we start doing some tempo and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I've, I guess seen you do patience, it. I've seen you do it you even know. quicker than that. Right. In the sense that even like coming back in the first week, you're like, man, eh, I did threshold for a bit and it felt just fine. So I'm back. Like, <laughs> yeah, it depends. Like, you know, you know I got, you know, I had COVID back in January. I was sick for, I don't know, a week, 10 days or so. And I feel like when it's a shorter time like that, it comes back 
you come back quicker. Like it wasn't like I was doing nothing. I was still riding just super easy and wasn't able to do a whole lot. And in that case, it comes back super quick. Um, but then like after like in October, November, I normally take a three week break completely off. And last year it was even more rest than normal. Cause I broke my hand. So, and I kind of hurt my knee and some other stuff. So I really didn't do anything at all for, I don't know, two and a half weeks. And it definitely seemed like it was a little bit further behind than I had been normally when I, during my off season, I'm running a lot more and maybe I'm still riding a little bit, just like doing fun rides. And I think I noticed that like I had lost a little bit more like aerobic fitness than I normally do. Um, but it came back almost as quick, you know, just like being patient, doing those longer rides and still like staying top of gym work and core and that stuff as well. So you kind of have mm-hmm. to kind of ramp it all up at the same time. I'm um, still focusing just as much on recovery and um, nutrition and all that. So to recap, when you're coming back from like a bigger break, like an off season, you typically take more time easing into it. That's when you're doing more base work anyway. Yeah. If like a month illness, or so, you know? Yeah. yeah. If it's illness, you really want to respect the illness, but at the same time, you're not afraid to, to just see how those harder efforts feel and to gauge that and to figure out when you can get back to training. Yeah, exactly. Just and then if it's cool. injury, you obviously have to play it extra cautiously. And that's basically what he's describing here. Cause surgery is a form of oh, injury, yeah. right? Right. And then you want to know, like, like you mentioned earlier, just like whatever your doctor says, whatever it's reasonable to get, but whether you're, you could ride on a trainer, maybe you can ride indoors, maybe like even just, even if you can't do high intensity, but you can ride easy for one hour, twice a week. <clears throat> like that's going to be so much better than nothing. Like just do whatever, yeah. do whatever you can really, whatever is safe and whatever it is you're allowed to do is going to be a, a lot better than nothing at all. Yeah. And if you're coming back from training and you're using, or coming back from time off for one reason or another, and you're using trainer road, if you look at your calendar and it looks like things are tough, you can just put on another annotation and say additional recovery, and it'll push your training out and it'll readjust and recalculate your plan and do all that. Or if you're just looking at a workout and you're like, I don't know if I can do this one right now, pick an alternate. It's okay. And then when you skip that workout that you were supposed to do, just fill out the reason when, with adaptive training, and then that will inform it and it'll be able to, to change your training. So or if you I, start see a workout. Ath- oh, go ahead. I see sometimes athletes just like delete the workout from the calendar and then they skip it. I would absolutely fill out that survey because then adaptive training knows why you skipped it. It's really, you know, that's a really helpful thing. Just like if you were, you know, if you had a coach and you just didn't do your workouts and you never told your coach why you didn't do the workouts, it'd be really tough for your coach to be informed to make good decisions. Same thing with adaptive training. You want to give it that information. So sorry, you can go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to even just trying the workout too. Maybe you don't think you're ready, but like, mm-hmm. even if you only get halfway through the workout and you get some of the work done and you're, you're like, Oh, I can't do that. I'm just still not ready for this. Like, that's fine. But you don't know unless you try it. And sometimes it takes a few workouts of like kind of pushing yourself to, you know, get the motor run, running again and get everything going. So like you should give yourself a chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't, um, yeah. Like you don't have to don't view it, that as a you know? failure. Yeah. Don't view yeah. it as a failure, right? Like you're, you're testing the waters, you're figuring it out. It's all part of coming back as long as it's responsibly done. So, right. Yeah. Cool. Chris's question says, Hey, trainer road team. Thanks for the amazing product and podcast. Since joining in late 2020, I've seen my FTP increase from 228 to 273. My question is in regards to hydration, specifically how much water is required for hydration for longer events. Most hydration advice seems to focus on sodium and I understand sodium requirements very widely based on individuals. I'm a salty sweater and I likely need to consume a lot of sodium 500 to 1000 milligrams per hour. That is a salty sweater. Um, now if this has been, if I good point, and we'll probably cover this in a bit, but there's a difference between assuming you're a salty sweater and knowing you're a salty sweater. Uh, but I'm sure we'll get to that. So does water play an important role in on the bike hydration? And how do I know how much I need? If sodium is the primary concern, can it be partially preloaded prior to an event? A, for an example, have 2000 milligrams pre-race in a bottle. Uh, thanks. All right, Keegan. So unbound wasn't hot, but it was really long. How did you fuel that? And let's just, even though this question is more about hydration, let's also talk about for you. I think that hydration and carbohydrate intake was, was inseparable. Like it was all part of the yeah. same. So how did you fuel unbound? Yeah, my, um, honestly, pretty much I, for unbound, I the same strategy as I do for pretty much any other event. I was aiming for 120 to 140 grams of carbs an hour. Um, mostly in uh, like 90 gram drink mix and gel. So I had just had like the never, the never second gels are 30 grams of gel, which is pretty nice. You get that little extra bonus over the normal 20. Um, so I just have 
uh, based off the amount of mix I was estimating I was drinking out of my pack. Um, and then one gel, it came out to be about 120. And then add in a couple other things. I had like a couple hostess coffee cakes and whatnot. Planned to eat more, but it was too wet. So I only had one. But the gel and liquid program worked really well. Um, if it was a bit hotter, I would have leaned the mix out a little bit because you end up drinking more to compensate for the like for the higher temperature, right? So instead of running 90 grams per 500 mil, I'd run probably uh, probably 60, give or take. So then you're drinking more fluids. So you're actually coming consuming the same amount of calories, right? And you could adjust that based off the temperature and how much you sweat and whatever else. So if you know you're gonna be drinking a ton, then you can't physically drink, you know, 90, 100 grams per 500 mil. You're just going to just bomb your gut. So I think you need to lean it out a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, just supplement on top of that with gels or whatever you want to use. But I think it's quite easy and for me. Like I mean, I'm down was a nine and a half hour race and I just, just ran it the same as I would for a three hour race. And it worked great. Um, I kind of learned that at the little 24 hour solo I did. I like the, for the first five or six hours at pace was I mean, relatively high for, you know, the start of a 24 hour solo. So I ran mostly off gels and, and mix, and then slowly transitioned into more real food. But I felt like I was like, well, if I'm fine with gels and stuff for seven hours, then I'm going to be fine for nine and a half. Um, so yeah, it's just easier. And if you can get the, it's better to get the carbs and the nutrition in than it is to like worry about like, if my, if like, I guess some of it's like palate fatigue and whatever, but sometimes you just have to do, do what you have to do in order to get, get the nutrition you need. And if you train it and you use it every day when you're riding, then your stomach's used to it. Your brain's used to it. It just doesn't care. I think it's the pe people run into problems when they train with like more solid food. And then when they go to race, their body's not used to having gels and all that. And it just kind of rejects it in a way. So you kind of have to train it a little. And it doesn't mean you can't eat solid food when you ride, but it just means that like, if it's a harder intensity ride, if it's only an hour and a half or hour long, I'm a trainer, you still need to, you know, use the same race fuel as you would for whatever race you're going to do. So, so Keegan, you're basically describing a trial and error process and, and you've landed on something that seems to be generally workable across all sorts of durations. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to arrive at that? Are we talking days, weeks, months of experimentation? Yeah, actually. Um, so I really, focused on the, um, getting the calories through the mix and the gels. When I, when I did the white rim FKT in, see, that was last year because the first time I did white rim, I like didn't have enough room in my pockets to carry all the gels and all the food I would need for five and a half, six hours. So I was like, well, if I run most of the, the calories in my mix, then I only need to carry one gel per hour, which is super manageable, you know? So I just started training like two months out. I started using heavier mix and just like slowly kind of ramped it up. I started off at like 40 or 50 grams per 500 mil and then worked it up to 80 to 90. Um, and at first I definitely did kind of mess with my stomach. You know, it takes a while to, at least for me, it took a while to kind of build up that tolerance and get used to it and also get used to like the stickier kind of feeling you get in your mouth. You know, it's not just water. So it's mm -hmm. like, it's a little bit different, but once you get used to it, it's just not that big a deal and you just have to practice and train it. Um, and sure. Sometimes water tastes, really good on the bike, but in my mind, you have to realize it's like pretty much just a waste. Like you're carrying it's a bottle. Just... A lot of opportunity cost, right? Like yeah. When you drink and like, it. yeah, sure. If you go to an aid station and you, you have a nice like cup of water, like sure. At times that's great. Like a pound, a cup of water and you can go and sometimes it tastes really good and it rinses your mouth out. But, um, yeah, definitely focus on mix. And sometimes, um, in these really hot races, I'll just use like salty water. I'll just put like the electrolyte tap, like electrolyte capsules in, or just use straight up table salt, just because sometimes you do want just that little bit of water, but if it's salt, at least you're getting some electrolytes out of it. So I feel like you want to at least get something out of your drink, especially with, um, you're, you're carrying water on your bike. It's a couple pounds. So you might as well be food in it too. Otherwise you're carrying the same amount of weight. Plus you're carrying all that weight in your pockets or in bags or whatever. So mm -hmm you want to make it as simple as possible. And then if you set, you know, reminders, like I have Garmin reminders popping up, telling me to eat every 30 minutes or so. So when you're in the bunch and it's hectic and crazy, then you don't forget. And even if you don't get to eat it right when it tells you to eat, you can be like, Oh, I'll eat in a few minutes once it chills out and I have time. So yeah, you just need to do what works for you and practice. How do you handle the sodium side of things? Like at unbound, 
Oh, where did you get your sodium from? Were you mixing that into your bottles? Sodium was just in the mix and the gels. I think that uh, never second gels have, I want to say like 200 milligrams of sodium per gel. Mm -hmm. So between the mix and the gels, uh, I was probably around 500, give or take. Um, which What's the brand name you keep saying? Keep... Never second. Never second. Yeah. 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 Can we talk about that really quick? First of all, this isn't sponsored or anything. I think he can sponsored by them, but we are not sponsored by them. But I want to, I saw in the, the Criterium de Dauphine, Chad, I don't know if you're mm. watching as well, mm. Chad, all, Chad and I message all the time. I always know that Chad's watching whatever race is going on. So it's good fun. I'm watching three uh, at the moment. There's, there, there's a so lot challenging when they run them concurrently. I mean, yeah. How do I, a first how do I world problem up? of the nth degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I saw that Primoz Roglic and his team, they had frozen gels. So they were like slushies. So, and then never second posted something about this. And they said, yeah, it's a formula that we have that, that you can put them in the freezer and they won't freeze rock solid, but they also <laughs> stay in a slushy state for a really long time. That's a really clever idea because yes. that, uh, I think that it's, Oh, Chad, maybe correct me if I'm miss overstepping here, but I believe that when we were talking about ways to lower your core body temp, like mm -hmm. the most effective way was ingesting something that was extremely cold. I can't um, remember if it was the most effective way, but it was touted. I as think an it effective is. Way. I know it's one of the most effective ways. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. I could, from my experience too, like we're training in Tucson this winter, those big, that big block it did before, or the, I guess the spring before unbound, there were some days where it was up to like 104, 105 and we were out in it and near the end of the ride, you just, you start feeling so hot and so mm -hmm. overwhelmed well you stop at you know a gas station and pound one of those slur like a slurpee or whatever they have in the in the ice machine you know and mm -hmm. it seemed like it makes a huge difference if you put down one of those things fairly quickly it seems like your core cools off rapidly and then it stays cooled off for an extended period of time at least enough to finish the workout successfully because i had a few Not workouts mention. where like i fully melted down and like i had one where i had an hour of sweet spot to do at the end of five hours and i like i felt it the heat like coming like i was like oh this is i'm gonna detonate and i did i fully detonated and couldn't do it so i was just hanging on to tempo for an hour instead of sweet spot <laughs> and then after that i started like focusing more on cooling off so i started to feel that feeling of heat like overcoming and you're like oh the heart rate's starting to crank up to like 150 160 just doing hard endurance and then i jump into a gas station and rip down one of those things and then i was good to go and get, mm -hmm. finish the workout so well, how about the psychological side of things too? Just having something cold in your mouth, feeling it go down. I mean, oh, it's amazing. Just, just that little boost that uh, has yeah. to count for something too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Slurpees are the best out of the, the gas station, <laughs> uh, the gas station slushies, the Slurpees seem to be the most refined, uh, <laughs> the most refined ice. The highest quality. <laughs> it's like 140 grams in one little Slurpee container. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. It's the way to go. Um, it, I, this is logistically complex because I don't know how... So when you have a team car with a cooler and it's following you and it's handing you gels, they can remain frozen. They can remain cold. Uh, for most athletes, it would be really tough to be able to do that, but it's really interesting to think of. Um, I really like that concept of taking, and, and my point, what I'm getting at here and boy, I, I, I truly apologize, Chris, because you're asking about fluid replenishment and we're going all over the place, but I, I want to, yeah. it is, it is all intertwined and, and what we take into our bodies we have to look at it always in terms of what's the most benefit it can give us. And then what is the opportunity cost of taking this in? Yeah. And what, and what are all the things you need from all the things you can and will put in your mouth? Yes. It's super important. And I feel that a lot of athletes prioritize just having a bottle of water or prioritize having a bottle of just electrolyte mix or, and, and do that separately. And when I look at that, I wonder why not just put this stuff into one and as a result, you can make sure that you're always getting carbohydrates because if you don't have enough electrolytes, you might cramp. Um, you might not, who knows if you don't have enough carbohydrates, you will start to run low on energy. If you're riding at any sort of like, you know, mid intensity and up. like it's the same, yep. it's the same effect. And I think, um, you can also like, you can also just carry a little salt, like the little electrolyte tablets and yes. then just take those with your drink mix. So I'll do that sometimes too. In a hot race, I'll carry those into a little Ziploc bag, or you can get those little, like those little rubber things that hold them. Yeah. Um, so yeah. they don't melt in your pocket and you just There's take also a couple of those and precision hydration has those, uh, blister packs that you can get where yeah, it's, exactly. and it's really easy to pop the foil. I just take those and I put it in the pocket. <clears throat> I think it's 250 milligrams. So I just 
pop one of those every half hour or so. Super easy. And those are an easy way to supplement the whole time. Yeah. And if you had, if the aid stations you're going to have on whatever race you're doing, get unbound, they had the the main aids. There are only two of them. And between the main aids, there were uh, just water oasis is they're called. So they only had water. So you either have to carry, if you're planning to use them, you have to carry either drink mix or you just carry some of those little salt tablets. And then it's an easy way to get your electrolytes with your hydration. So I think you should need to have a good, have a good plan, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and keep in mind, if you take in 500, like, let's just say that you're a normal sweater, if you take in 500 milligrams or 2000 milligrams that taking in 2000 milligrams, isn't going to make you faster, right? Like the 500 is probably sufficient yeah. if you're a normal sweater. And when you're talking about per hour, but then if you talk about carbohydrate, if you take in 50 grams or you take in hundred grams of carbohydrate, there is going to be like a performance difference between that. And that's and your body's that's also, cool your body's not going to the difference between 300, 400, like even 500 or 600. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. You just need to be getting a, like <laughs> close to the, enough electrolytes as you need. It doesn't, you know, if you're not exactly getting 500 or exactly getting a thousand, it's not like your body's going to shut down. So I think it just needs to be ballpark. You just need to know, okay, I need roughly between 300 and 700. And if it's yeah. hotter, maybe go to the upper end. If it's cooler, don't worry about it so much, but mm-hmm. yeah. um, I just don't think you need to stress electrolytes as much as uh, you think you do. Last point before we jump into fluid replenishment, the exact question that we were <laughs> asked at this one, <laughs> but as somebody in the, in the chat says, I took Martin on my last race and it got hot. It was gross. It also dried out my mouth. It's awesome for training though. And that's what I'm trying to break. It like, don't think that nutrition is good for training and then not good for racing. You should be taking in nutrition for performance and you perform in training, you perform in racing and you get used to it. Like, first of all, any hot mix. Yeah. It's not ideal. If like the actual liquid itself is hot, it's not going to taste great. We always want to have cool stuff. So do your best to cool it off when you can't, it's fine. But like Keegan and I joke around all the time we talk about it, it's the taste of speed. Like, like if you don't like it, then you're not going to go fast. Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> and also if you that, run that's it a, in that's a, an uh, important point. Yeah. Just, just the, the, run, the work rate yeah, is a concern here. So Keegan's talking about doing a ton of work for hours on end. So yeah, 120, 140 calories or grams of carbohydrate per hour are necessary. But mm-hmm. if you're out there riding at the back of a grand Fondo or gravel race or something, and you're working at 60% chatting and not even hitting eight stations, but just, just keeping it low intensity, no, you're not going to need hundred plus grams. You probably won't even need 90. It's, it is relative to how much work you're planning to do, but it's also limiting. If you want to do a ton of work, I've been plenty of situations where I wanted to work harder, but I wasn't feeling appropriately. Yeah. That's the thing. Like if you do feel extra on that bike for most athletes, I mean, if you're like 200, so if you're a 250 watt FTP or above, you're going to be burning probably more than you can replenish. I think it's 230 mm-hmm. or 220 is like a typical inflection point. Hmm. So we underestimate what we actually burn on the bike and how we can replenish it. So well, this dovetails also into don't diet on the bike. And, and if you're looking at this, like prioritize fueling, if you have to prioritize one thing over and ever, uh, over another, particularly over just sodium or anything like that. And yeah, taste of speed. If you don't like it, it's okay. Just don't expect to go fast. So, um, mm. uh, let's go into this part of Chris's question where he talks about fluid replenishment, Chad, it's kind of like the, the tried and true, simple, accessible method of just weighing yourself before and after a workout to figure it out. But mm-hmm. what are some more, and I guess that could be scientific as well, but what are some recommendations that we can get from the scientific field about fluid replenishment? Mm-hmm. So um, we're, we're going to look at three papers pretty briefly each, but d- with each of these, I hope to bring something new to the table that we haven't discussed before or reshine a very bright light on things we have discussed before because they are important. And most of them are pretty simple. I do want to start, however, by remarking on Chris's sentence, does water play an important role in on the bike hydration to which a lot of people would say, duh, of course it does. It's water, but I get where he's coming from because how many times have you heard in recent, uh, <laughs> geez, probably last two, three years, water doesn't hydrate, pure water doesn't hydrate. You're basically wasting your time. It's not true. It absolutely hydrates. It assumes certain things though. Do you have carb or do you have sodium on board? Do you have a little bit of carbohydrate going? I mean, it's, it does hydrate under most circumstances, but we're talking about the extreme end of things where we're running our sodium levels down, where we're sweating profusely, where we're exposing ourselves to 
hot weather for long periods of time. And in that case, yeah, it becomes quite a bit more complex than hydrating with straight water, but simply water does hydrate. And, and however you balance your sodium and your carbohydrate and your water, it's still water that's doing the hydration. It's just, it, it kind of distracts us from the point. And I don't want anyone thinking water doesn't hydrate, that it has to be something else. Whatever that something else is, it's largely water. Okay. Anyway, aside, aside from that, there are a couple of bits of advice for you, Chris. There are two necessary self-learnings due to athlete subjectivity that you got to get your head around. First is what's your sweat loss rate. And secondly, what's your sodium loss rate with those two bits of information, you're completely armed. You know, everything you need to know to be able to get your hydration strategy, just right. And then you can try to figure out how that weaves into your nutrition strategy too. But the reason this is so complex and the reason you need to know at least those things is there's a tremendous level of subjectivity when it comes to appropriately hydrating, you know, you hydration, not under, not over, not hypo, not hyper amongst which the, the rate of fluid absorption between athletes. And this is something that can fluctuate minimally on a daily basis, incoming sodium, sodium levels, intensity that we just talked about the environment, you know, what are you dealing with the temperature typically being the, the primary concern, the clothing you're wearing. Um, are you a heat acclimatized acclimated athlete? What's your recent training history? Are you off the couch? Have you been training for a long time? Have you been subjecting yourself to heat, et cetera? And something that I don't think a lot of athletes consider, what is your tolerable level of dehydration? Because some athletes, you hit that 2% or 4% or whatever it may be, and performance does suffer. Some athletes can go well beyond that. It's, it's, it's just an interesting thing. So over time, you can learn. I'm an athlete that can tolerate a greater level of dehydration. It doesn't mean you're going to intentionally subject yourself to it. it. Just means that should you encounter it, doesn't mean you're going to fall apart. You can, pro you can probably keep on going. Um, and then with regards to the studies themselves, let me just touch on a, a couple, each of them presents its own key point. One from uh, Nancy Rarer, Rer let's go with 2001. She notes that sweat rate subjectivity is typically, you know, in hot conditions, a liter an hour is a pretty safe bet, hot, humid, whatever it may be, but that can range up to three liters an hour plus. So we're talking a big range there. And if you don't know where you fall on that spectrum, well, you're not working with the necessary information and the same goes for sodium. And then Keegan mentioned salt packets. If it's sodium chloride, and it was in Nancy Rare's study, you do have to recognize that sodium only accounts for about 40% of that particular compound. And then regarding the sodium itself, that it, it, some indications that you're on the higher side of things. So if you're experimenting with your sodium intake and you're wondering, am I getting it right? You haven't actually tested it. You're just kind of trying to self-assess. If you're puffy, bloated, any form of edema or, or water retention, if your weight goes up, not necessarily, you know, body composition, but just weight. If you crave plain water, if you're averse to salty foods or liquids, these are all indications that you're probably on the higher side of things. And then the flip side of that <clears throat> indications that you're not getting enough sodium, pretty obvious, you know, you're thirsty, dry mouth, lightheadedness, lethargy, um, and sometimes higher than often enough, higher than you'd expect heart rate with the usual heart rate caveats. And then also in her paper points this out, the inclusion of carbohydrate aids absorption. We've talked about this before and strictly with in relation to fluid absorption in the gut, this is a very light concentration, three to 5% carbohydrate concentration. Reason being is because the more uh, carbohydrate you introduce into the mix, the more you increase the potential for a mismatch between your gastric emptying rate and your fluid loss rate. So basically you can be sweating out more than your GI tract can absorb. You know, you're, you're not replacing the fluid as fast as you're losing it. And this leads to amongst other challenges, GI distress, dehydration, counterintuitively, sloshing in the gut, all these things, which point to the takeaway I'm trying to make here is that you have to actually train to drink during exercise, much like Keegan mentioned. Okay. Next study, <laughs> Robin Darjeet Singh. I think I got that pretty close. 2003. Nice job. It's on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I sounded out. Actually, sounded I, out. I don't I know. I shouldn't say, I should cheating. say nice effort. I don't, I have no yeah. clue if it was actually correct. Yeah. I think I'm close. <laughs> um, his paper, uh, their paper was fluid balance and exercise performance. And uh, Singh notes that drinks low in sodium are ineffective at rehydration. Okay. We've covered that, but a point that is made is, and will only reduce the stimulus to drink. And I think this is important because it notes that your lack of thirst can actually be misleading. Water can actually fool you into feeling, but not being hydrated. 
And, and this kind of reminds me, it's, it's similar to the way that the color of your urine, urine can fool you into the same incorrect assumption. I mean, when we want to say, you know, I'm dumping water into the system. Of course I'm hydrated. My urine's clear. Of course I'm hydrated. Well, these things may not be true. Mm-hmm. And then finally, a uh, 2021 review article by Lawrence Armstrong. I, I like this one because it offered some really nicely quantified practical information in particular five planning methods. And, and it really just covers all the bases. First there's drink when thirsty, pretty obvious. Ad libitum gets talked about a fair amount, which is just whenever and how much there's no real science or structure to it. Individualized planning, which we're super keen on. And frankly, is just the way to go if you want to be competitive. And then the extremes drink, nothing hard, no, and then drink as much as possible in excess of thirst. Also a hard, no. And then, uh, Lawrence closes the paper with nine rehydration recommendations and I won't cover them all, but it, it's the same idea. You talked about this, Jonathan body weight before and after exercise to see what, what the change was due to fluid loss or gain, um, observe salt deposits on your skin and your clothing. This will give you some indication of whether or not you're a salty sweater, uh, sodium consumption is covered and is, is one of these rehydration recommendations and probably the key point necessary experimentation. And, and, and that's just, that's how it works. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. Some people are going to be a lot different. You have to figure out where you are on each of these spectrums, how all this plays together. And one way uh, the best way I think to start is to get a sweat test and a sodium test and uh, precision hydration. We talk about them a lot and I'm sure there are other services that offer this, but they have a free online sweat test where you can kind of calculate it and get it into a pretty small ballpark. And then they have, you know, facilities or people who will actually conduct an advanced sweat test, sweat and sodium test. So you can see not only how much, but how much sodium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause there's sweat volume and then there's sweat composition and those, like you were talking exactly. about Chad, and those two things are really important to figure out. Keegan, you were mentioning the fact, if you see a bunch of salt stains, uh, we, when we were talking about this before going on air, you see a bunch of salt stains on your Jersey, you might assume I'm a super salty sweater, but you might just sweat a huge amount of volume too. And as a result, if you're in a dry environment, something like that, you might have a lot of sweat stains. So these tests are important to figure out Gatorade, I think also has some patches that, hmm. uh, that you can get. I, I don't know of their effectiveness. I haven't used them, uh, myself. I've done a couple of different methods. I've done tests where I have a piece of gauze effectively on me. And then that gauze is taped to my arm. And then I work out at a given rate, but we've heard from Andy blow from precision hydration. You can listen to previous episodes we've done with him. Uh, we've, uh, he said that really the sweat rate doesn't or in terms of the sodium loss. It doesn't change a whole lot. When you talk about activity level, your sodium loss, when you're sweating, sweating, doing 60% FTP versus doing 120% FTP doesn't change a whole lot. seems to be genetically controlled, but also variable and trainable for an athlete. Like your body will, you know, ebb and flow with this. And Jonathan, and correct, sweat- correct me if I'm wrong. Did he say that? Cause, cause we know that one of the adaptations to, uh, heat act or part of heat acclimat- acclimation or acclimatization is that you begin to your electrolyte loss rate kind of tapers a bit. But yes. I think he said it's not enough to substantially f- impact your sodium intake. As I remember, that is correct. Yeah. Um, it'd be good to go back and listen to those episodes for anybody that's listening to this now. Some great recommendations there. He does talk about sweat rate and how your sweat rate, the amount of volume that you, or forgive me, sweat, the volume of fluid that you lose, how that does change with training and adaptation to heat. So if you are in really hot conditions, I'm sure we've all felt this and recognized this, boy, you'll sweat a whole lot more than when you're in cold conditions. But also notice that when I'm more fit and I'm doing more training and my body is having to sweat to cool itself more regularly, that it tends to turn on those sprinklers a bit earlier, you know, like, like it's, it's trained to do that. So these are really good things to figure out. And the basic way of weighing yourself, I'll just go into the details of that super basic good way to do this is do an indoor workout, or you can do an outside one as well. It doesn't have to be indoor or outdoor, but start off in your kit. And then, and I, I would just do everything that you're going to wear and then have your two bottles with you or have your bottle with you, whatever it is. And then stand on that scale, check that weight, and then get on your bike, do whatever ride or workout you're on, go straight back and hold those bottles with you and then measure what the difference is. So, uh, know your, the weight of the bottles as well, and then measure out that difference. How much of, how much you've lost, uh, it can should be you, a helpful kind of easy way. Should to do you it. be in your kit in that case? Cause if it soaks a bunch of your sweat up, that sweat that's being weighed, but is actually not in your body. That's a good point. I was going to say that too. That. Yeah. Yeah, I, good point. Yeah. Cause I, I've done some of these actually on the bike too. 
when I was getting ready for white room, trying to figure out basically the minimum amount of water or fluid I needed to get by. So I tried 200 mils per hour and that wasn't enough and just figure out, you know, when I could go without exploding over the course of four hours. So it was an interesting yeah, test. That's a fun experiment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds real fun. Yeah. 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 But you, you yeah, learn you did, quick. You pushed it down to the line with that one too, right? Yeah. yeah. Like down to the You only carry so much, you know, so mm-hmm. it's all self-supported and the less you carry, the less you weigh. So intentional dehydration, not very fun. Um, functional dehydration. Functional. Yeah, functional. I like that. Yeah. Too. yeah much. <laughs> Tom says, Hey team, five stars podcast. And then products, of course, go rate it on Spotify. If you're listening to this right now, five stars. Let's be number one. We're number one on iTunes. We need to be there too. So short question. Whenever I see efforts in my workout longer than five minutes with a uh, flat power output, I always search for alternates, which using the alternates feature uh, for something similar, same difficulty and same zone that we're talking about here, but they have wavy topped intervals. Is this okay? Or is holding a single power number and staring at a 20 minute countdown an important skill? Many thanks. Keep up the great work. Cheers from Tom. Good question. Uh, Chad, uh, what, what would you say in this case to Tom? Uh, first off, it's probably not a bad thing to be able to very tightly regulate your power output. It's not a bad skill to have, you know, that, that arrow to have in your quiver. It's, it's not a necessary thing. And, and when we're talking about differences so subtle as these, which is really just a, at the, at the high end of things, it's a fluctuation between 88 and 94%, you know, the covering the whole sweet spot range, depending on how you define it. And that's some, some pin it at 88 to 92, but either way, we're not talking big changes in power output, especially if your threshold is, you know, sub 200, you know, if you're up at 400 watt threshold, maybe that's, but even then it's, it's, it's still relative. So these are not differences worth concerning yourself with. And these take place anyway. If you turn off smoothing and you look at where your power is over the course of a 20 minute interval, it's going to be all over the place. And it's going to range more widely than the 6% range we're talking about here. That's kind of beside the point because what's most important is that your body and your muscles aren't going to differentiate between these subtle differences in power output. The physiological stimulus that we're trying to apply is still going to be the same. Uh, and it's overlapping. It's not even if you drop out of sweet spot and now you're down at 85% or 80%, you're still garnering most of the stimulus that we need to further the particular adaptation we're seeking. It's going to happen anyway. So don't get hung up on the, on these little subtleties. Do understand, however, that while you can take this, uh, I'm not sure which you said 20 minute, but let's say a three by 30 sweet spot workout. Say you've worked up to where you can do these very long intervals in a you know, a two hour workout, 90 minutes at sweet spot. Is there a difference between doing three 30 minute blocks, nine tens, 18 fives, 33 minute intervals with short recoveries in between again, not so much, not physiologically, but as you move closer to your events, we're less concerned with time and zone and how that time and zone is achieved. So the priority first is being able to do the work, being able to do 90 minutes at sweet spot. The priority then becomes, how am I going to have to emulate that or, or, or how's it, how am I going to have to produce that when it comes time? Am I going to have to do 20 and 30 minute climbs on a road race? Am I going to have to be able to just ride 30 minutes up a roller and coast 30 seconds down the other side? Then you can start to doctor the, the format, the structure of those workouts to suit. Yeah. And this doesn't just apply to one zone. It can apply to the other zones as well. Right. Chad, in the sense that the objectives are still being met. Uh, yeah. Key, and there's something to be said for the mental aspect of like, kind of like setting yourself a difficult or like intimidating goal and then knocking it down with training. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, uh, kind of both ways are good. I think sometimes I've like, I'll do like three by 20 LT intervals, threshold intervals a fair bit. And for those sometimes, like, let's say the target is 380. I'll do, you know, 370 for five minutes. I'll do 375. Then I'll do 380 and then I'll go to 390 for the end. Sometimes I'll just stick it at 380 for the whole time. I think, they both kind of have their place and it's good to learn how to do those steady efforts. And then, but it's also not that big a deal. If you float a few Watts over and a few Watts under, especially if you're doing them outside, then like there's just a variance in terrain can change that a little bit. So if it gets mm-hmm. steeper, you can go up a few Watts. If it's flatter, then you can go down a little bit in the end, it's going to average out to be the same. Um, and then like when I do like a 20 minute power test, for example, I found I best success at those when I just stick it at, the same number the whole time. Um, even if it's an ambitious one, sometimes we go, okay, we're just today, we're going to do 410 and then we're going to see how long we can do that for. And it is what it is. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely, it's definitely important. I think to do that kind of work where you're just, you know, just grinding and just sticking at that same power. Um, but if it's a really hard 
workout. If, like for me, when I'm doing five by fives, which is, I dread those, um, <laughs> I'll trick myself and I'll do like three minutes at this power Then I'll do two minutes at just over or whatever. So you can, okay, we're just going to do a three minute interval. Then we're going to do a two minute and you can, you know, play these little <laughs> games, even though it's only a difference of like 10 Watts, which is nothing when it's like, it's, if the target's 450 or 460 or whatever, you're pretty much just going flat out, but 10 Watts seems like it makes a little bit of a difference in your head. So whatever it takes to get through the workout, I guess, in the end, if you can do it and just stick it at that target. Then that's good. But if you need a little help to get through it on that day, then find a game or a way to get through it. You know, I derive a lot of like confidence from when I'm getting fit and I can just stare at that number on my head unit or on the screen, whatever I'm using to do my workouts and I can just hit it. And sure. I fluctuate up and down and that's not the point is to be perfect because erg mode tricks us all into thinking that we're more perfect than we are anyway. Right. So well, yeah. if you can do erg mode outside on your own, then you're, then you're doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. what Keegan just described, making little games of it, is effectively what those undulations are about. I just don't want to pose for 10-minute intervals or whatever the workout was, but rather make it just a little bit different so that you're slightly more psychologically engaged. And it, it's just, it's not as daunting. It's not as intimidating. Yeah, especially when you're indoors. It makes a big difference mm-hmm. to have a little more to, to think about instead of just doing a 10 or 20-minute interval straight across when you have these little undulations and things yeah. changing. Yeah, I, it's like, it's really helpful. So right now I'm doing a block for Tahoe trail 100 because Ivy and I are doing the team relay. It's going to be a blast. I'm going to be lap one. Ivy will be lap two. If you're going to be at that race, uh, I've been talking. So Alex wild, uh, he's up here too, around this time right now up in Tahoe, which, which is cool. He's going to be doing the race. We even talked about doing like a pre-ride beforehand, whether it's like the Saturday before or something. So if you all are interested in that, that are doing that race, let us know. If so, we'll probably organize something. Uh, it could be cool. But anyways, I'm training for that. And I know that that one, we were talking about racing earlier and how to pace yourself. That's absolutely one where I'm just doing one lap. So it's going to be, I can go harder than I would have if I was doing two laps, but still I'm going to be really paying attention to power to try to pace myself. Cause I'll easily be able to cook myself on that course and just blow up too early. And going into this, I'm going to be doing a lot of longer work. And I love getting to the point where I can face down a 20 minute interval and not be afraid of it. I think there's something like to that where you can Mm -hmm. look at a hard block and you can say, yeah, I might mentally break it up into five minute chunks or whatever. That's fine. But when I can look at a 20, 20 minute efforts on my training plan and I go, yeah, I'm not scared of that. I I've got it. There's the physical side, but then there's also the mental side of it. I think that we build up kind of a resistance to take on those really big blocks of work and it can get a little intimidating, but boy, once you get to the point where you can handle them, just boost me with confidence. I show up on race day and I'm like, yeah, I got this. Like, go ahead, drag out that pace for as long as you want. I'm going to be right here. I've got it. I know I can do it. There's a lot of benefit to it. So yeah, I'm going to be looking forward to it. Uh, let's go into a, a couple, if you have live questions or if you have any questions from the live audience, we have just a couple minutes left that we're going to go on this one. So, uh, we'll cover them. Uh, one of the questions that I see right now from the live chat is, uh, is there anything wrong with picking the highest level alternate workout, like picking the most productive alternate with the highest level? So basically when you look at workout alternates with a trainer road, it's super cool. You can look at a workout and they'll tell you if that workout is, uh, is achievable, productive, a stretch, a breakthrough or not recommended based on your progression levels. Super nice. So then that way, if you're looking at workouts, you can understand because many times our eyes are bigger than our stomach or our legs as it were. And we pick workouts that we can't really uh, do. So in this case, you can figure it out. I know it's not the, there's nothing bad with picking one that's at the higher end of the productive range. Uh, As long as you feel that you can do it, give it a shot and then fill out the survey afterward. And that'll inform adaptive training. So it's kind of a silly question from Bjorn. Uh, I like it though. I've been thinking of a way of training. He says, uh, let's say my target FTP is 300 Watts, but I can't hold that for more than five minutes right now. Would it be possible to do a five minute, do five minutes one day, then six minutes the next day, and then step it up to seven, et cetera. And would the, would the body adapt like this? Chad, this sounds like the Pete Morris 400 watt training plan that he tried to do when you were just what trying to get in. <laughs> Yeah, you're on your, you're on your shooting, man. It's pretty 400 watts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're going to do this, right. Might as well set it high. Uh, yeah, it, what, are, what are your thoughts? Might be possible. We don't know what your capacity is. So, I mean, this could be a sustainable growth rate for you. Uh, you could have, have a tremendous ability to adapt, recover, you know, you're maximizing your recovery or for whatever reason, your body is really good at recovery. 
uh, it's going to peter out at some point <laughs> peter but <laughs> give it a, give it a crack i mean worst case it doesn't work and you learn something about yourself and got a little bit of training in the meantime um yeah. logically probably not i mean again it'll it'll fade when it fades so <laughs> who knows how far you can yeah. push it question i guess is really could you be spending your time better probably yeah, for sure. I'm thinking of it. Basic training principles, novel stimulus is one of them that I think of. I think of training energy systems and how your body produces work at different intensities relative to your threshold. So if 300 Watts right now, if you can't hold it for more than five minutes, that sounds like it's VO two. So, uh, if you just keep doing VO two, it doesn't eventually become your threshold or mm. perhaps it will. I don't know if you just kept doing it, but there's much better ways to get there. And it's about supporting it that building that aerobic fitness that you need that muscular endurance that you need to be able to sustain those efforts. And that's done with lower intensity work. Um, that's going to be supporting that. So, you know, you kind of want to have a mix. Like we talk about Chad's, we've mentioned this plenty of times, you know, the, the floor raises as well as the ceiling goes up. And we do that with different types of work that we do. So, uh, threshold or endurance work or, talking about VO2 or any different ways, there's lots of ways to be able to push it. And if you just do one type of training, it's not likely going to just push it up and suddenly become your threshold. That would be a lot more difficult, a taller ask for your body for sure. So, okay. Uh, let's look at the next one. Oh, from Bruce it says, how do you use your software when I only have a bike and a heart rate monitor, no trainer and no power meter on the bike? Yeah, you can do it. Uh, use outside workouts. You can do all of your workouts outside and there's a little toggle where it says power-based or RPE-based. You can just make them RPE-based or rate of perceived exertion. And that means that you'll get all your workouts. You can follow an entire training plan. You'll just get them in terms of uh, RPE targets, which is pretty cool. So it makes it a lot more success or accessible for folks that don't have power meters, don't have indoor training setups, the, the whole deal. Uh, all right, we're up against the time. Keegan, what's the next race for you? Uh, probably crush from the Tusher. Not hundred percent sure yet. Maybe I'll find something to do between now and then, but, uh, currently that's the next, next on the plan. The next, life, next race in the lifetime series. Yeah, there we go. So we'll be able to see yeah. it. Um, we'll hopefully be able to see it depending on the live stream. Um, yeah. as that, uh, that's probably going to be a hot race, like, like toasty typically could be. Yeah. I mean, it's could be hot. It goes up and it starts in Beaver, Utah, goes up and over the mountains. And then on the backside, it can be a little bit hot but then it cools back off as you go up back to the finish. The finish is up at the ski resort, which is like, I think over 9,000 feet. So it's a little bit cooler up there, but it you've definitely raced, can be hot. You've raced Tusher before, right? Yeah. I've done it once. I think just once before. And you won. Ago, I think in 20, no, I think I was second or third behind Todd and maybe Rob Squire. Um, okay. Yeah. It was 2016 or it was, it was a while ago. Cool. Um, I'm interested to see this is your turf. I mean, it's the closest yeah. lifetime Grand Prix gets to your turf. So yeah, a couple hours yeah. from home. So there we go. Yeah. I'm excited to see how that goes. Uh, anything, uh, if people want to follow you, Keegan, where do they do it? Uh, Instagram over at uh, Kegels 99 and Strava, just Keegan Swenson. Everything's there. All the rides training. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. All right, everybody, if you're listening to this, go to trainerroad.com slash podcast and submit the questions that you have for the podcast. And we can answer more of them next week. We appreciate you always doing that. It's crazy. 387 episodes. Is that right? Or 367 episodes, 368. Goodness me. A lot of that. You've been doing that for years now and we appreciate it. So keep doing that. And then go to trainerroad.com and sign up for trainer road. Give it a shot. Uh, if it's just, you have six more weeks until your big goal event, something like that in the summer, do it and see how trainer road preps you for it. It's going to be pretty awesome. Guarantee it. So give it a shot, Chad. Thanks for joining me. Keegan. Thanks for joining me. We'll talk to y'all next week. Thank you. Thanks everybody. See ya.